Okay, we'll go into match drilling of fastener holes. This is something that I touched on earlier, which uh, has to do with making sure that the holes match whether they're in their true position or not. And by having a, a pilot hole in one part and then drilling all the way through with the uh, mating pieces clamped in position. This way you have a precision hole even if the holes are not in their true positions because they, uh, they can be off a little bit and still, still be close enough. And I have some examples of mismatched countersunk holes in the uh, next figure. Now, notice that this mismatch usually causes head bending, which is uh, bad news. These, these are cases in which, see, in the first one there, the holes match but the countersunk is not in line. So uh, you have head bending where the arrow is up there. The, uh, over here, we even use the wrong countersunk uh, hole. And uh, because there are two normal types, 82 degree and 100 degree countersunk heads. And so if you use the wrong one, you're in trouble. Here, we have the holes parallel, but not in line. And here the holes weren't even parallel, so we're real trouble there on, on bending on both of these. So uh, what uh, you have here is a case in which you need on countersunk holes to use the same drill fixture, put all the holes in through everything so that at least, even if it's a little bit off the uh, 90 degree alignment, at least everything will match and you're in better shape that way than you are. If you have one of them drilled right and the other one drilled at a slight angle, then you're in real trouble. Now, knife edges in a countersunk hole. Knife edges are stress risers and are to be avoided. In fact, the uh, aerospace industry makes a big issue over this, that thou shalt not do it. So if we go on to the uh, next sheet, uh, it will show some examples of this, and I can just talk from the examples. Uh, there is a knife edge right here, and you see that edge can be very jagged and develop cracks real easy, so therefore you're not supposed to have that at all in a critical uh, application. You're supposed to make sure that you have enough thickness that you can countersink and still have a piece left here to avoid that, that knife edge. In fact, uh, having the uh, countersink be no more than two-thirds of the thickness of the sheet is one of the uh, criteria that the aircraft companies use. Then going to the next page, now here we have dimpled and countersunk holes. In this case, we have the countersink in the bottom sheet. We dimpled it just simply by hitting it with a tool to make this one fit so we could have a flush surface up here. And that's in, in the case where, you, where the top sheet is too thin to countersink in it. Then where both of them are too thin, you can actually dimple both of them and still have a flush surface. Now, uh, as I understand it, this is still allowed, where's Tremarkey, on uh, small airplanes. They still allow dimpling. Yeah, Mario, you, fl you fly, so, so this will make you feel better. They allow dimpled holes on small aircraft, but they don't allow them on the big ones because of the fact that uh, where you deform the metal like that, there's danger of developing cracks. So, uh, so the, the major aircraft manufacturers prohibit that. Now, dowel pins, they're, they're a very important thing and have an important function, but uh, sometimes people want to use them in ways they shouldn't be used. They're close tolerance pins which are used to align mating components, and that's really the, uh, their major function. They're usually mounted in one, in, uh, one of the pieces with a slight interference fit. Then the mating piece has a close tolerance hole to slip over it, and you get good alignment of the pieces. And then you bolt them together, or however, however how you want to fasten them together, and you analyze the bolts for the total shear load. 
And you don't use the dowel pins and bolts together to calculate the load because one of them is interference fit and the other one isn't. So therefore, the dowel pins would load up first. So now if you want to put enough dowel pins in to carry all the load, you could do that and then just hold them together with the intention with the bolts. But you can't use two different fasteners that have different to fit tolerances and say that both of them are going to carry load equally just like you don't use bolts and rivets together because the rivets would fail before the bolts pick up any load because the rivets interference fit and the bolt isn't. So, uh, so that's, that's the way that they're supposed to be used. Now, you can design them to carry all the shear load, although normally you don't. And now here's, here's one of the things you can run into with dowel pins. If you put them in blind holes, they're kind of hard to remove. So uh, particularly if it's a solid pin. So it's a lot better to have a through hole to put a dowel pin in so that you can take a punch to the back side and, uh, and knock the thing out. Or uh, use a vented pin with a groove or a flat edge for blind installations just to make sure you can get the thing out. And tapered dowel pins are available and uh, pins with external serrations or ridges to prevent pin rotation. So you drive the thing in place and it has serrations on the edge of it that keeps it from rotating. Now, shear allowables for dowel pins are usually determined by the manufacturer's test programs because a lot of the times the irregularity of the cross section means it, it's uh, uh, difficult for you to calculate the cross sectional area that you have. So. Uh, it's easier to use the manufacturer's values for it. So some of the common types of dowel pins that we have. Here is a plain solid one. And pebble grained even. Uh, this one is uh, one of the ones that we, uh, Fred Yaris's people made for me with uh, some sort of a, a new system that they had that gave it kind of a rough surface. Then we go to the drilled and tapped dowel pin with vents. See, these, these even have little uh, grooves around them so that they will vent and you can uh, pull them out. And then they have a drilled and tapped hole so that you can run a threaded rod in there of some kind or screw and actually pull the thing out with the uh, rod. Here's a groove dowel pin, and this one actually, this, this groove is on it to uh, uh, give it a little bit of compressibility. You, uh, so this, the grooved end would be slightly larger, and it, then you can pound it in, and the groove will close up on some as you're uh, pounding it in which is uh, because you notice the groove doesn't go all the way down. It's just to one end. Then this is a vented dowel pin here, and the groove does go all the way down so that you, can get, so that you don't pull any vacuum when you put the thing in the blind hole. Now here, here's a type that, uh, that I, I like, and uh, we use some of these because you can pull them. This is the uh, tapered dowel pin with a jacking nut. So that one you can slap it in the hole and then when you get ready to take it out all you got to do is tighten the nut up and that'll pull it. So those uh, those are pretty uh, pretty good if you if you've got a place where you can use them that way. Now roll pins or sometimes called spring pins are actually made by rolling a piece of thin alloy steel or stainless steel to a given diameter with a chamfer on each end of it so you can take a hammer and drive it in the hole. Uh, it's then heat treated to a real high hardness and uh, the coil cross section on it decreases in diameter as you're driving it so that you have an interference fit. Now the slotted tubular pin is one that's not really rolled up, it's just a cylindrical piece of tubing with a slot cut in it. And you can use that also as a uh, spring pin. So there's one of each shown on the next page here. Here is the roll pin, which is wound up. If you look at uh, 
that one I believe you can see it better there that it's actually overlapped rolls of material so that uh, it'll develop more load of course than the single slotted tubular pin here. These are used for installing cranks and uh, I know that I've seen them used on bicycle cranks to hold them together and uh, they're easy to tap in place and if they're in a through hole then you can take a uh, punch and knock them out when you get ready to uh, take them out. Uh, the, uh, once again the load carrying capabilities for these are usually determined and tabulated by the pin manufacturer because due to the irregularity of the cross section it's hard for you to calculate it directly. And that will conclude roll pins and our next section when we come back will be on rivets.